Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. I'm coming to you from Spokane, Washington on this beautiful sunny late winter's day. And I am so excited that we just have a few more days to wait until spring officially begins. Now today is going to be my third and final video about dealing with vegetable garden insects organically. And boy, have I got some doozies to share with you today. Cucumber beetles, Japanese beetles, squash bugs, and squash vine borers. Oh, these are all awful. Now, don't get mad at me, but I have to tell you, I don't have any of these insects in my garden. Yeah, I know, I'm very lucky. I realize it's probably only a matter of time, but so far, so good. However, as you all know, I am the author of the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, and I did a ton of research to write that book so that you would know what they look like, which plants they bother the most, how to deal with them using organic strategies and methods, and so I have a lot of information to share with you. Now, as I've said before, first of all, I don't have the bugs. Second of all, it's way too early in the season to even show them in a garden anywhere here. And so I'm going to have to use photos to give you basically a photo slideshow showing you what they look like and talking about different ways to control them. So we got a lot to cover today. Let's get started. Now I thought I'd turn the camera around to the normal view you see of our garden because all of this is in the sun. There's almost no snow here. But you did get to see the south side of our garden that's in the shade of some trees and we still have quite a lot of snow there. Now before we get started today, I wanted to remind you about something that I talked about last week. If you purchase plants from a garden center or a plant sale, which are great resources, be sure to check over the plants thoroughly before you hand over your money. Look at the leaves, top and bottom, make sure there are no insects and no insect eggs. I cannot tell you how many times people have said, I never had this problem until I brought the plant home from the garden center. Ugh. So save yourself some grief and check them over before you buy them. Better yet, start all your plants from seed. Let's start off with cucumber beetles. There are two species, striped and spotted cucumber beetles. In addition to causing plant damage, they also carry two serious plant diseases, bacterial wilt and cucumber mosaic virus. They are about one quarter inch long. They overwinter in plant debris in or near your garden. They emerge in the spring and lay eggs in the soil near their host plants. The larva hatch and chew on the plant's roots, as well as on the rind of fruits that are lying on or touching the soil for about one month. They pupate in the soil until they emerge as the adult beetle. And there are usually two generations of these horrid little beetles each year. Which crops do they damage? You would think they would only bother cucurbit family crops so things like cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, and squash. But unfortunately, they're also attracted to other crops, beets, corn, potatoes, and tomatoes. I don't think that's fair to you. They primarily chew holes in the leaves of plants. You might first notice some of these plants wilting. The good news is that they do have natural predators such as assassin bugs, parasitic wasps, and tachinid flies. So how do you control these horrible things? Whenever you have a really damaging insect pest that overwinters in plant debris, it is very important to clean up the debris in your garden at the end of the growing season. And I would dispose of it to be on the safe side. Don't put it in your compost pile. Since the beetles pupate in the soil and lay eggs in the soil, it's important to rotate your crops by planting the crops they're most attracted to in different areas of your garden every year. 
I do realize that this isn't very feasible for a lot of gardeners who have really small gardens though. Did you know that there are some varieties of cucurbit family crops that are actually resistant to bacterial wilt and cucumber mosaic virus? That is worth researching if you have been plagued by these awful pests. So when you're looking at different seed packets, look for the initials BW for varieties that are resistant to bacterial wilt and CMV for resistance to cucumber mosaic virus. There are actually quite a few and I'll put some links in the video notes on my YouTube channel. Start your cucurbit family crops from seeds indoors so they get off to a good start before you plant them into the garden a few weeks later. And cover them with floating row cover until they start to bloom to also get them off to a good start. The cover will need to come off as soon as they start flowering. Interplant aromatic plants with your susceptible crops to repel the beetles. Marigolds, shown here, and catnip are supposed to work well for this. Put a thick mulch under the plants to make it harder for cucumber beetles to lay their eggs in the soil. Put boards underneath any susceptible crops such as cucumbers, melons, squash, and pumpkins so those fruits are not touching the soil. Keep a close eye on your garden so you spot the beetles as quickly as possible. You might consider applying beneficial nematodes, which are microscopic roundworms, to your soil. They will target the soil dwelling stage of this insect. Other organic products that are supposed to help include neem oil and spinosad, but remember that both of these are toxic to pollinators, so don't use it near flowers. Phew, I know that's a lot of information, but I'm hoping there will be some tips in there that you haven't tried. Let's move on to Japanese beetles. Many of you deal with this awful invasive insect in your gardens and boy are they challenging. They are native to Asia and are so destructive. The adult beetles are one half inch long and they have metallic green and bronze bodies. If they weren't so darn damaging to our vegetable crops and ornamental landscapes, we might think they're beautiful, right? The most common sign of their damage is skeletonized leaves. Their larvae are about one inch long with dark heads and a V-shaped pattern of hairs on their hind end. The beetles emerge from the soil in June, feed on their host plants, and mate. The females lay eggs in the soil under turf grass. Their larvae chew on the roots. They overwinter deeper in the soil and emerge as adults the following June. The beetles only live for one to two months. Which plants do they damage? They love basil, beans, collards, corn, eggplant, lettuce, peppers, and tomatoes. In addition to the skeletonized plant leaves, you'll probably see dead sections within your lawn. The good news is that these pests do have natural predators in the form of assassin bugs, birds, moles, parasitic wasps, robber flies, skunks, and tachinid flies. Even though I don't have these beetles in my garden, I have done a lot of research and found some promising possibilities for controlling them. First of all, hand pick the beetles on a regular basis. Just carry a bucket filled with soapy water and knock the beetles into it. Consider applying beneficial nematodes to your lawn. 
These microscopic roundworms will target the grubs. You can find them at large well-stocked garden centers or online from beneficial insect suppliers such as arbicoorganics.com. There is a beneficial bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis galeriae that will target both the grubs and the beetles. This is fairly new and very promising. If you cut back on the frequency that you water your lawn, as well as the amount of water you use, that will impact the grubs because they can't handle the drier conditions. Now this last item is not my idea, so please do not get mad at me. During my research, I kept coming across the same thing. So many reliable sources recommend that gardeners not put Japanese beetle traps in their yards. Why? Research has shown that the traps are attracting even more of the beetles to your garden and more than what will fit in those traps. A lot of gardeners have told me, but I'm catching so many beetles in my traps. Why would I want to stop putting them out there? Again, what's happening is that they are bringing in more beetles to their garden, many of which are not getting caught in the traps. So the traps are actually making matters worse, even though it probably doesn't seem like it. So there, I've said it. Please don't shoot the messenger. If you want to read some of the research, I'll put some links into the description of this video on my YouTube channel. I think you'll find this interesting, even though I completely understand how frustrating these horrible beetles are. Now, in keeping with my theme for today's video, squash bugs are another insect pest that is incredibly challenging to control. They are also carriers of a bacterium that causes cucurbit yellow vine disease. It's called that because within two days of becoming infected, the leaves all turn yellow very quickly. The brown adult bugs have flattened bodies that are about 5 8 inch long. The adults overwinter in the garden debris, emerge in the spring to lay brown eggs, usually between the veins on the leaf undersides like you see in this photo. The eggs hatch into small nymphs that go through five instars or life stages during the course of four to six weeks. In northern regions like where I live, they go through a single generation during a year, but there can be two to three generations in warmer locations. Which crops do they damage? They mostly damage pumpkins and winter squash, but can also be a problem on summer squash, melons, and cucumbers. Both the adults and nymphs tend to scurry about when you approach the plants. You know they're active when you see little specks on the plant's leaves, which leads to wilting and plant death. Place floating row covers or agricultural insect netting over the bed as soon as you plant the seeds or seedlings. You'll have to remove it when the flowers start blooming so that bees can pollinate them or you could keep them covered for the whole season and hand pollinate the flowers yourself. Don't put mulch underneath the plants because that gives the bugs a place to hide. Never compost any plants that appear to have cucurbit yellow vine disease. Dispose of the plant material instead. Clean up plant debris both during and after the season ends. Always closely monitor the plants for problems and handpick the nymphs and adults as well as look for eggs and squish them. If the size of your garden allows it, rotate where your susceptible crops are grown every year. I've heard that you'll have less problems with squash bugs if you grow your cucurbit family crops up on trellises, so that's a thought. And be sure to look for varieties that are resistant to the disease, 
such as butternut, early summer crookneck, improved green hubbard, and royal acorn. The final insect for today is squash vine borers, and they are also a dreadful cucurbit family pest. The adult is a red and black moth, and most of us tend to think of moths as being nocturnal or active at night, but they're actually active during the day. Their larvae are cream-colored caterpillars. The moth is about an inch and a half long, and the larva is about one inch long. The larvae overwinter in the soil in brown cocoons, right where their target crops grew. They emerge as moths in the spring, mate and lay a single egg at the base of the host plants or on the soil surface next to them. The larvae hatch in a week and start boring into the stem of the plant. They feed for about a month, then leave the plant and pupate in the soil until the following spring. There can be one to two generations per year. Which crops do they damage? Squash vine borers primarily target pumpkins, summer squash, and winter squash. Be sure to watch for yellowing leaves, wilting or dead plants, and puncture holes in the stems at the base of the plants. Squash vine borers have two natural predators, ground beetles and parasitic wasps. How can you control these things? If the size of your garden allows it, rotate where your susceptible crops are every year using a three-year rotation. That means making sure those crops aren't planted in the same area more than once every three years. Always clean up plant debris in your garden and remember to dispose of the host plants rather than composting them. Monitor your garden on a regular basis. Crush any eggs you find and watch for those distinctive moths. You might be interested to know that the moths are actually attracted to the color yellow. So if you have a yellow pail or container, fill it with water and a squirt of dish soap. They will fly in and drown. But keep an eye on it because sometimes other insects are attracted to the color yellow. Consider wrapping the lowest part of the plant stem of your pumpkin or squash plants with a collar of aluminum foil to prevent the moths from laying eggs into them. If you determine where a caterpillar is within a vine, you can carefully cut into the vine, remove the caterpillar, and put some tape over the cut to let the plant heal. Well, I just threw a whole lot of information at you, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry about that, but I do hope that I gave you some good ideas of things you can try in your garden. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. Happy gardening.